Hello everyone and welcome back to Dragalia Foundry, a fan channel where everything Dragalia Lost can be found. This video is going to be all about Chapter 23, Part 2 of the main campaign. I'll be sharing my thoughts, opinion, reaction on everything that took place in this latest story update. But before we get into things, I do want to warn you that we'll be talking about everything that's happened in the main campaign so far, so careful for spoilers going ahead in this video. It's also been a little less than a week since this new content release, so I went more cavalier than normal with the thumbnail. Hopefully that doesn't catch anyone out there off guard, but I was so excited about some of the character moments in this chapter that I wanted to share what I thought were some of the most exciting characters there. So yeah, chapter 23 part 2 by far exceeded my expectations. I think that I've had the impression for a few chapters now that the story is getting a little bit convoluted or a little bit busy for my liking with some of the plot around the progenitor, but this one took things in a direction which I feel is going to be much more tractable over the long term, much more palatable as we go forward, a little bit less focused on some of the abstract philosophical queries that we may have, and more about a tangible quest that our protagonist and party will be on in the foreseeable future. So looking forward to discussing all of that about the main story, as well as our obvious indicators about our next Gala adventure. But before we get into the full story conversation, I do want to briefly talk about what's happening right now in Dragalia Lost, because I still feel from my This Month video that January is one of the best months we've had in quite some time to really jump into the game, and especially for players who may have missed out on some previous events. In particular, you can probably hear that really nice background music right now for the Princess Connect Redive collaboration. So that is being rerun right now. It's a great opportunity to pick up some of the special stickers from that event, lots of good rewards by playing the raid, including your free five-star adventurer, Forager Cleo, who you can befriend. It also features Pekarine and Forager Mitsuba. It's a really fun event overall, so I hope you're liking it, especially if it's your first time playing through it. We get a nice login bonus to go alongside that, and this is coming out of our previous event, our Coliseum event rerun, Fortune's Fray, which also had a login bonus that was pretty fun as well. So also upcoming at the end of this month, it was announced that Azura's Blinding Light is happening on the 25th. That is our third Legend difficulty battle in the Sinister Dominion. We recently got Iblis's Trial, Shadow Element. That raid battle is part of Trials of the Mighty. You can get materials for unlocking Sazanka's Mana Spiral, and she ended up with a pretty good one was pleasantly surprised that she ended up getting a Mana Spiral, was not one of the characters I would have thought would get one. Our light showcases are happening until the 30th, so expect to get news about our next gala around that day, if not a little bit sooner. And then finally, this may have been buried in the news for you here, but uh, it was announced several days back at this point. A version update is coming tomorrow, or at the latest, the day after, depending on when you choose to download it. That's going to mean we all get a tenfold summon voucher. We're getting two new events in the event compendium, Shadow of the Mukurosho and Elementary Escapades, the latter of which I think is really, really fun, so glad to see that being added to the compendium. Some support for upcoming content, balance adjustments so that Kimono Knots and Sandolphin are no longer going to automatically shapeshift, at least outside of the Clyde Escape, should make it easier for them to maintain their healing. A balance adjustment so that Ilya's alchemic cartridges are now exempt from Curse of Nihility, which I know many players have wanted for a while. Some changes to the Prince's Four Strike nodes, voice lines for the mini dragons, and this is one that I missed the first read through, but there's going to be new abilities in the Kaleidoscape that you can unlock for your Fafnir that increase the intake of Dawn Amber and Dusk Amber. So those are probably going to be great ones to upgrade right away, so that in all your future grinding, you get more amounts of Dawn Amber and Dusk Amber which you can then spin to unlock further Fafnir upgrades or just to clear out the treasure trade. So yeah, some good stuff happening in Dragalia Lost. All of this besides, we know at the end of this month we're getting an event centered around the Alberian Royals, which I think is going to be super fun. But having said that, let's get into our conversation now about Chapter 23 Part 2, all about the Progenitor. Most of the time when I do my story reaction videos, 
I played through the hard and very hard difficulties and just show off the battles as we talk about what happened in the story, but this time around I wanted to share a feature that I haven't talked much about but actually came out quite a while ago in a previous version update that I think is pretty cool. So if you're not aware of this, now in Knott's Notes, our encyclopedia area, there's actually a story section as well. So you can click into stories and you get all sorts of content here on past facility events, raid events, defensive events, and so on. You can read through past stories. In addition to that, for all of the main campaign chapters, you can click in here, and instead of going through all of the different quests as well, the battle quests, you can just read the stories. And another thing that's pretty cool about this are these characters and memories buttons. So this is where we'll really get into some things that uh, are pretty spoiler heavy. But when I click on characters here, you can see there's uh, there's some characters in particular that we're going to have to talk about in this video. So let's start a little bit back with uh, Baron. So at the end of chapter 23, part one, Baron basically declared that he was going to become the vessel for the progenitor's return on his own and kind of took attack that I wasn't really expecting from him. He had this evil smile on his face. I'm not sure if maybe this was a way for the writers to sort of just deus ex machina Baron out of the plot. And it seems to always be something with this character, like the fact that he just shows up and absorbs more Sayati, or now suddenly making the decision unilaterally to become the vessel for the progenitor's return, and uh, not try to form a familial bond with Yudin or even with Ferris, and he sort of wants to be the one that ushers in the progenitor. I really don't know by the end of this chapter what happened to him. You know, was he just a cocoon that then morphed into the progenitor's true form? Or was Baron's body just left there? Uh, was it ushered off somewhere by the progenitor themselves? So yeah, that's kind of a little bit of an uncertainty, me uncertainty to me, but basically the chapter begins with uh, the progenitor's true form emerging from this type of dark or black mana process that Baron initiates. In the in the wake of that, I guess, it seems that Ferris is like totally free of the progenitor's influence, which is not something I expected to happen. I will say I was a little bit confused over the past few chapters of like, when is it Ferris talking? When is it the progenitor talking? And I think they did a pretty good job of detailing that with the character names and also with the facial expressions but it did surprise me that all of a sudden Ferris was just like a good guy again and sort of had the same memories and was like a normal human. One thing I'm a little curious about is exactly when all of this took place. When did he become the host to the progenitor? Was it around chapter seven of the main campaign? Is it before that? I hope that that's something we might find out in this month's end of month event featuring the Alberian Royals. I think Ferris would actually be a really good character for that. I know we haven't had a lot of content about Valux either, but he did kind of have some side events where we got a little more characterization, and his whole arc with Zethia and Nedric also gave him a little bit more characterization too. But if all we've seen of Ferris so far is really the progenitor's machinations, it would be nice to see Ferris himself in his research phase when he's trying to cure his dragon scale and maybe learn about why he turned to the progenitor's influence as a means of doing that. I think that would be a pretty good theme for an event, but that might not really tie in the whole Alberian family together. So maybe they even take it back a step further and maybe focus on like the time of Aurelius. Who knows what's gonna happen with that one, but needless to say, by the end of this chapter, Ferris had sort of effectively joined the party and was uh, a willing companion, willing helper of our crew he and the other members of the royal family end up going back to Alberia to sort of take care of things there while Yudin continues on another quest, but it was still cool to see him finally really be part of our group and acknowledge Yudin and just not be this evil menace to the world, which is of course Xenos. So this is something I was not expecting to happen at all, to actually see the progenitor get a true form reveal, if you will. Just how the origin is called Bahamut, and we think of Bahamut as one of the creators of the world in Dragalia Lost, at least as of the most recent few chapters, same deal with Xenos being called the progenitor, and I guess being the other creator of the world. 
So this character seems to be extremely overpowered at this point in time relative to the power level of our main cast. So the fact that uh, someone showed up to save everyone, it doesn't really make sense when you think about it. All of that could have just been rewound in time, rewinded, because Xenos has the ability to basically undo things that happened. It kind of reminds me of like in Naruto, Naruto Shippuden, I guess. Isanagi and Isanami, something like that where effectively he can kind of undo reality. Also a little bit of Shulk vibes of kind of vision of the future and being able to change how things actually transpire. But that is the level of power of this being that we're dealing with. The ability to manipulate reality itself, which, uh, yeah, that's way outside the realm or the scope of anything we've had to deal with in the past. With maybe Kronos or Kronos Nyx sort of coming onto that level where if you're able to manipulate flows of time, maybe Grimnir too, or Aether, uh, or gosh, who was the uh, who was the reskin of Kronos Nyx in Grimnir's event? I can't remember, but yeah, both Kronos and Kronos Nyx have had rerun events, sort of. Um, but anyway, maybe something on that level is kind of there, kind of up there, but basically we can't dent uh, this person or this being because they're just able to rewind the clock on any type of damage that's dealt to them. And so it doesn't bode well for our party. And you could see the, the nice little design here with the cubes. I love being able to see these portraits in the story gallery, by the way. But to be honest, the other thing I think of when I see this portrait is just Kingdom Hearts, just flat out. It just reminds you of something that would be in Kingdom Hearts, especially as the story has drifted into this idea about you know, possibility versus predetermination. The story has leaned into some of these metaphysical trappings a lot, and that just feels like kind of a Kingdom Hearts thing to layer onto a regular shonen plot. So anyway, Xenos is revealed, but of course the person, the star of this chapter, the person who saves the day is none other than Emil. This is a standard portrait here, but Emil basically shows up when all hope is seemingly lost and is leading the Dire Nell army and able to usher our main party out of Grams, during which time Xenos decides to kind of do the whole Satan thing that we saw a while back and slumber in the center of the city, absorb more black mana. His true revival isn't complete. Of course it's not. Villains' true revivals are never complete, right? So he's got to do that, or they've got to do that, I should say. And in the meanwhile, Emil is able to usher the party to safety, once they kind of recuperate, we're also able to help some of the refugees in the city of Grams and try to lead them to, uh, to brighter horizons too, or at least outside of the desolation that lies in the wake of the Satan incident and now the Xenos incident in Grams. So as uh, Xenos is absorbing or creating, maybe manifesting this uh, fog of black mana around the site of their revival, well, there's also all these fiends spawning in the outskirts and just throughout the world, but centered around northern Alberia. And so the party is able to use the Grand Fior and use walking by foot, use some other tactics to try to lead the refugees into Alberia where they can seek shelter. But it's a nice moment in that everybody kind of has some strategic roles to play. I feel like all the siblings have some some purpose, and there's a point in which, as soon as he wakes up, Yudin in particular is like, we have to go stop Xenos. I'm gonna go charge back there and battle him. And Emil just has the best clap back reaction, just shuts it down completely in a way that I found to be extremely refreshing. Emil insulting Yudin with every other breath, it feels like a character trope that I don't think he'll ever come past, but at the same time, a lot of what he's saying is true, right? A lot of what he's saying, it has a weight to it that I think Yudin is, it's finally kind of getting through to him that the shonen protagonist way of, you know, believing in your willpower to be able to do everything that you want, that is not the only way and often that is a very foolhardy way. And so for Emil to have had this kind of revelation from the trials that he's faced and the shortcomings he's faced over time was really cool. 
I really liked it. I still kind of feel the way he's written, uh, the, the haughtiness, the insults. He kind of reminds me of like a lemon grab, uh, Adventure Time character if you're not familiar, where it's just a little bit much for my taste, but it's almost comically so to the point that it's kind of gotten to be a little endearing, his personality, and it just shined in this chapter in ways that truly surprised me. So we got to see some more of his use of music and the arts to inspire the people and lift their spirits. He expressing the idea that a ruler doesn't have time to be downtrodden with the people. They have to lift up the people. And Shell saying that he's finally able to use his unique talents in a way that really helps out society and makes him a good ruler. I thought that was really cool. And then the monologue he gave to inspire everybody to go into battle. So let's get to that next. We have to go here to see this. So memories. You can see Baron... Oh, I guess it's going to actually take us into a little video segment, sort of. But uh, this is Baron. This is just Baron doing Baron things, I feel like. How many times is Baron going to do this to us? Absorbing more Sayati, becoming Xenos. It's just classic Baron at this point. But Emil, we haven't seen this side of Emil, in my opinion. So Emil gives this monologue to the people. This is probably the portrait where he shows up with the Dyrenal army. And is just helping usher our party away from uh, Xenos, from the progenitor. But there's another portion where he gives this monologue to the refugees who fleed from Grams and essentially tells them they kind of want to give up and they don't have the will to fight. And he tells them, you haven't earned the right to give up yet. I've tried all these things and failed at all of these various things. And that's why I really know what it means to give up. I know when you've exhausted every option. I know when it's time to run and flee. And you have the audacity to think that you could just give up without even trying. Oh yeah, I guess this is it here. You could see these are the people that he inspired to battle. And somehow he gets the, the rabble of Grams to fight at his command. And they're so moved. And basically he tells them like, Sometimes in life, you're just going to have to stand up for yourself. You can't count on other people to help you. There's a cynicism to what he's saying, but there's also some truth to it. And so overall for me, I mean, the Gala portrait, clearly he's going to be our next Gala adventure. I just thought it was a big success. And so finally, the way that the chapter ends is Ilya has some knowledge. Ilya has knowledge along with Nedric and, uh, and crew about what to do, what we might possibly be able to do to stand up against the progenitor, and it's to awaken the primordial forms of the Great Worms, to unlock their memories, to unlock their true power, because the world tree showed memories of this world in which at some point in time, these Great Worms that embody kind of the natural elements of the world, at some point in time, they actually had the power to lock away the progenitor or stop the progenitor. So this basically sets up our next quest. We're going into a desert, Gatov's, uh, Gatov's home. Let's see if we can actually skip to seeing that preview, if it'll pull up here. But going into Gatov's homeland, we're going to learn more about that. It's also the place that we're supposed to learn about kind of why we're fighting these primal great worms or trying to unlock their true power. And so I think it's a good direction for the next story. It's simple enough that I feel like it's a lot easier to grasp than the conversation about possibility. Okay, I see they're in uh, in order descending. So it's actually this last one where we're embarking on this new quest. But we also split up the party a little bit. The royals stay behind to take care of things in Alberia. So we've got Yudin, we've got Ilya Gatov, a few others who are departing. So I think that's going to add some variety to things too. Maybe we'll learn more about Sheila, about Gatov in this next release. And yeah, it doesn't show it here. So we'll jump to the main campaign to show this really quick. But overall, I came away liking this a lot more than I was expecting. I'd be really curious to hear what your thoughts were in the comments below. I know the story isn't for everybody. Not everybody even reads through the story of Dragalia Lost. You might just be here for the gameplay content and that side of things. But uh, after a few chapters that were kind of rough for me, this one really hit for some reason. So I really liked it. Let's see here about our preview for next time. Here we go. Primal Strength, Chapter 24, Part 1. The party arrives in the fallen land of Lefkos, the former home of Gatov, which is now little more than a wasteland. 
There they seek the graveyard where the primordial dragons are said to rest, which is sealed off by black mana. Within that place awaits the truth of Lefkos' destruction. All this and more in the next campaign update. All right, y'all, I think we should leave it there. Let me know again what you thought about the chapter in the comments below. But that is going to do it for today, though. So thank you as always for watching. Take care, and I'll see you next time.